Welcome back. When we last left off, Fate, and a little bit of creeper tickling, had left us an enormous ball of dirt to harvest. I intend to dedicate all of that dirt towards a more nuanced mob farm, but first, let's get rid of that, shall we? The location and design of this new mob farm is fairly important. I want it to be close to where I spawn, because I will be dying a lot from it, but not so close to the rest of my everything that mobs will be able to easily chase me down and murder me. I also want it to be far enough away from everything that mobs will continue to spawn at all times, which means within a 64 block sphere, but also tall enough that they will keep spawning while I'm using the farm. This means the farm will need to be at least 24 blocks taller than the surrounding terrain, but again, that 64 block restriction in a sphere still applies. It must also be wide enough to allow extremely thick mobs to use it without jamming it up too much. These demands bump up the dirt requirements for the farm by quite a lot from my estimated 17 stacks, and I'm going to need to pop some more creepers before I can finish the roof and killing room. After I lightly torch up, that's a joke, you can laugh, the creeper platform so that I can see what spawns without disrupting it, it's a fairly simple matter to reroll mobs until I find a dirt creeper. I actually get two, and after a great deal of careful operation prove that I have learned my lessons well and successfully detonate both of them in the correct spots. I collect the dirt, just before night falls, and return to building after a quick death to refresh my hunger. As my weapon and armor situation improves, hunger is increasingly going to become a bottleneck in my work. This will not be changing for quite some time, however, so I soldier on and sip instead from the infinite bounty of the void. Or I would, if I could remember which gravestone had my torches in it. I don't even have chests yet, and sorting is becoming a problem. Good grief. I also realize I didn't relight the mob platform, so now Endermen are going to mess it up again. Frustrated noises intensify. At least I have mobs now, though. That's an improvement over the first episode. Since I currently lack dirt, and night time, I decide to install the rest of the water in the mob farm instead. While I do that, I should mention that water in Greg Tech New Horizons does not infinitely spawn from source blocks like it does in vanilla Minecraft. I'm not sure why this was implemented, because there are tons of other ways of automating water production even this early in the game, and in the situation I'm in right now, surrounded by literally nothing, even that is not enough to make this much of an issue. My best guess is that it was to prevent people from feeling like they had to manually top up their water supplies every time they ran low, but it might just have been an aesthetic choice. I try to swing a creeper spawn from the farm before night passes, but no luck. The next day, I'm able to get one from the tube. After the usual surgery and masterful tail wiggling in its general direction, I get it halfway up the creeper detonation platform. I lose sight of it for a second, and I guess this is long enough for it to lose interest because it then turns around, walks away, and just waltzes off into the void. I do not understand mob pathing in this version of Minecraft at all. What a waste. I get another one later in the day, and this time I take a different route. Incidentally, look at the size of that creeper. Good grief. When I get him on the stairs, he turns around and does the exact same thing as the other one. I am being scammed. I take a bit of time to change the stair design just in case it is a weird pathing bug and wait for night to spawn me some more. Once I roll a spawn cap that has a couple, I camp out on the tube. It turns out to be a waste, though, because apparently the creepers despawned and I didn't notice it, and I am left with nothing except a piston, which will admittedly come in useful later. I eventually get a third tube creeper, and it actually goes where it is supposed to go. I have no idea if my fix worked, or if I just got lucky. And with that in my belly, let's go finish up the farm. The roof of the farm is easy, I patch it up, pull the torches from the inside, and work my way down. The bottom of the farm is more tricky, and ends up having several uh, deployment issues. I eventually get everything patched up, but am still dirt short, so I will have to eat the tube for resources. 
This is honestly fine with me. I've been leaving it torched up anyway, so I'm not getting any use out of it. <coughs> a little bit of engineering later, and we have ourselves a mob farm. I have gone through all of my greys and pulled all of the useful blocks and items I got from Infernals. We have four loot bags to open later, by the way. And use them to give me some redstone controls for the farm. The pistons on the end will prevent mobs from falling into the void, allowing me to kill them manually if I want to. And if I want to stop the flow of mobs into the farm's killing chamber, I have a third piston further up the water chute. This will be useful for things like zombie villagers or creepers that I want to break out and move around. To help me see inside, I've placed some iron doors to act as primitive windows. They aren't great, but mobs won't aggro through them, which is kind of all I care about. Almost immediately, I get a redstone from a lightning creeper. And since the only redstone carrying signal item I can make, a redstone torch, needs it, I'm going to make sure to pick up as much as I can get my hands on. At this point, most of the super awful dirt grinding is out of the way, so I have a stable, safe, ish farm design that lets me filter mobs, and now I just need to wait for things that I want to kill to spawn and then jam into the chute. With the new farm process of mob farming being so much easier, it's kind of ridiculously simple to get stuff that I want. Spawn rates are so high that I can basically pick and choose which infernals I want to kill, and I only ever really take damage from infernal effects and weird hits that sometimes come through the corners of blocks. My farming times are more of a function of hunger now than health, and if my inventory fills up, I can just take a quick dip in the void to fix both of those problems. I pull another dirt creeper out, though at this point I don't really care. If I never need dirt, all I have to do is wait. I take the time to open my accumulated loot bags and get an enchanted golden apple, which is three times rarer than the regular kind and can't be used to cure villagers. Very funny, Minecraft. I pull another dirt creeper out. I'm honestly just going to start stacking them on the new platform now and make this giant pile of dirt balls because I don't really need the stuff and I don't even think it's worth commenting on them at this point because they are that common. After a fair amount, but not a terrible amount of time passes, I finally get my first natural gold apple drop. I take it back to the quickly growing storage area and swing by, looking to open all of the loot bags that I've stacked up at this point, but it looks like I'll only get the one for today. That's fine. Zombie villagers are annoying to find at the best of times, and half of their variants don't show up on the mini-map, so this will just live in my inventory until I'm ready for it. I do take the time to mine out some of my ever-growing dirt stash and build cages for any zombies and witches that I find, though. No sense in being unprepared while I have the resources. While hunting for my elusive zombie villager, I end up running low on HP. I do my usual dip in the void trick, and only then notice that somewhere along the line I have picked up a second golden apple. This is not hugely surprising, because they aren't really all that rare, and I've been doing this for a while now, but it is very much a nice thing to have, and I wish I could have caught it on a clip. Oh look, a witch is spotted, it specifically heard. It is also unfortunately the wrong kind of witch. As a general rule, if you don't see the witch icon on the minimap, then witches won't have weakness potions. The alchemist effect can sometimes be used as a substitute, but usually that effect is paired with things that you don't want your villagers to be near, so I will just instead farm for a witch. I can hear another witch in the falling chute, but have been waiting for so long that the spawner is plugged with spiders. Normally, I could refresh the mobs by jumping in the void, but I can't do that here without losing one of the zombie villagers I've captured. The fact that I can see its icon in the minimap also means that it is the correct kind of witch, because as mentioned, modded ones usually can't throw weakness potions, and dull of those won't show up without an icon. Once I isolate the witch, that RNG strikes again. It has the choke effect, which basically means I will take constant chip damage unless I hit it regularly. And it's also poisonous, so I will take constant ship damage if I do hit it regularly. I decide that I want to have it kill me before I try and cure the zombie, that way it won't be infernal and will make my life easier. With a little more wiggling, I get a lucky early weakness effect, slam the apple down the villager, and banish the witch. This took, I kid you not, over three hours to complete. Ugh. 
Here's hoping for a saplingy villager. And it's bees! Oh boy, do I love bees! Gosh, jolly gee darn it, I love me some bees! Jerk. I go back to it. And almost immediately get another zombie villager in the farm. Nice. Because of the other villager in the capture pen, when I free it, it goes right over to where it's supposed to go. No baiting needed at all. Convenient. The game seems to be done with messing around with me, because literally not 30 seconds after I kill the cliff I was taking when moving the villager, a witch drops down the chute. A, a real one, not a modded one with an icon and everything. Score. I try to use its withering effect against me by killing myself to reset its infernal status. I fail, however, and am unable to punch it again to get the effect because I am too weak, so I have to starve myself really quickly instead. Either way, the job gets done. The switch is far less cooperative than the others, and it takes multiple deaths before I can get a cure off. Either that, or it was running low on weakness potions. You could never tell. And it's a forestry villager! Yay! With the wrong trade! Boo! As counterintuitive as this sounds, though, this might actually be a good thing. I thought about it for a bit. And this is kind of the worst of the best possible scenarios there are for villagers, because these guys do not have that many trades in their pool, and almost all of them are saplings, which will give me at least a little wood. However, if we do manage to roll a sapling trade after trading for this one, which is a grafter, we can guarantee sapling drops by using the grafter that we had to buy anyway on the leaves from the tree that we purchased. The problem, of course, is that I don't have enough emeralds to buy anything yet, and when searching through my stuff for emeralds, the farm decides to spontaneously explode for no apparent reason whatsoever, dumping water all over everything. A typical Greg Tech moment, right there. I patch the hole in my farm, secure the villager as best as I am able to, read in dirt with a torch for company, and resume the grind. As an aside, I'm pretty sure getting wood is going to be the single most difficult thing to do in this pack for like five episodes at least, and the worst of it is over. Thomcraft mini bosses are not super rare, and the uncommon loot bags have about a 25% chance of dropping an emerald, so this is really only a matter of time. In really no time at all, I have a handful of loot bags, and one of them is nice enough to drop an emerald. With the one I got in the first episode, this is enough to trade for the crafter. You jerk. Alright then, hold please. After shockingly little time, I amass a collection of 14 common loot bags and 10 regular loot bags. I figure this is probably good enough for a couple of emeralds. By my math, I should get about three and a half. So I decide to crack them open. Out of all of them, I get six emeralds and a bunch of other random junk. Uh, this is pretty okay in my book. I also get random splash weakness potions, which is super neat, so no more witch baiting for me if I ever have to heal a zombie villager again. Sadly, there are no golden apples, but overall I'm pretty okay with this result. Time to go visit our recalcitrant friend and feed him green rocks until he pops. 32 urine-colored wooden planks later, and I end up getting a plantain sapling as my third roll. I have literally never seen this thing. Yeah, I'm fairly certain that plantain also isn't a tree, unless you're talking about bananas, which are a separate kind of tree, so I'm not really certain what this thing is supposed to grow into. So I pop over to a test world and sprout it up. So, initial thoughts. Lots of leaves, which means good things for its sapling yield, and it generates a workable amount of logs, although not a fantastic one. The one weird part is that I can't seem to figure out how to turn it into planks. Uh, when the item drops, it gives me banana wood, and there isn't any associated banana plank. It has the log wood tag in Forge, though, so at least I have logs, but not planks. Yay? I am getting really tired of the game trolling me at this point. Except, hold on, eat it, you lousy game, I can just craft a better sapling. By trading for, growing, and harvesting a plantain sapling, I'm going to get logs and more saplings. 
This lets me make a crafting bench, which lets me make a pickaxe, which lets me make a furnace, which lets me make stone, which lets me make mortar and pestles, which gives me bone meal, and I can combine all of those things from sticks with witches and plantain saplings to make a Greg Tech Plus Plus rainforest oak sapling whose wood does give me planks. It's simple. Uh, trivial, really. I have no idea why I was concerned at all. Anyway. In the time that it took me to draw that out, I farmed out some more loot bags. Gimme those goodies. And wow, those were way more generous than the other ones. No complaints here. So, come here, villager, and give me your lame, scammy, bogus sapling. I have a game to beat. And presto. Sapling grown. While I execute my brilliant plan, some fun trivia for you. Silverfish stone and cobblestone look identical, and out of respect to that, the What Am I Looking At plugin calls them the same material to presumably prevent exploits. Uh, what it doesn't do, however, is it doesn't conceal the hardness and blast resistance numbers, and those are different for silverfish cobblestone and regular cobblestone. More fun trivia. Despite murdering plenty of witches, I also only have five sticks. The solution to this, of course, is more saplings. I have enough sticks to make a hammer, a saw, and a file out of solid gold ingots, very blingy, which give me the power to strip leaves off of a sapling seven times. Greg Tech, everyone. Regardless, I plant my new totally not genetically modified sapling, bone millet, and presto, wood has been solved. I crank out a few of the introductory quests with my newfound wealth and then get to work. One moment. Through the power of wood, I present to you a cleaner working area brought to you by shovels. Wow. Gravel, which I didn't need wood for at all, but I need flint, so whatever, bite me. I guess I just started caring about gravel now. Uh, reusable storage. More reusable storage, because I have too much junk. Oh, please help me, I have too much junk, and I haven't even entered the Stone Age yet. Farms, which, again, I could have done before, but whatever. No more gravestone collections, because I have real storage now. An improved mob pen, because I still have a use for this thing that you'll see in a little bit. And it also didn't need wood, but bite me. Crop sticks, for a weed. Z weeds. As in, unwanted plants that break crop sticks, not haha, -ha, funny number, Canadian flag plant. This one is a bit of a weird one, so I will explain in a moment. And finally, a bed. So that now, at day 57.6, by my math, we can finally, finally, go to sleep. This has got to be a world record for slowest bed percent in this run. Anyway, back to the weeds. This mod pack has industrial craft to crop breeding in it. Industrial craft crop breeding is basically the birthplace of breedable anything in Minecraft in this mod pack, and something like 80% of the crops are entirely useless at any stage in the game. I see this as proof that crop breeding was a great mechanic implemented with absolutely zero thought given towards practical implementation, but one that is useful to me right now is also, conveniently, the easiest to get. Weeds. These are normally a punishment that you get if you don't pay your attention tax on time, and they will very quickly eat your expensive pedigree crops by overgrowing everything with more weeds. Basically, it's just kudzu, but angry. They are also useless, except for a weird aesthetic feature that most people will never encounter and fewer still will have a practical use for. Weeds will spread, air quotes there, to dirt blocks nearby, converting them into grass blocks. And finally, after almost a day of playtime, real life, I can finally touch grass. We are minted up to our eyeballs right now. We got grass. Grass blocks, of course, mean passive mobs. They also mean seeds, because in order to get seeds in this pack, you have to hoe grass blocks rather than breaking tall grass. Why? I have no idea. Pointless mechanic past the first five minutes of the game, and probably an accidental addition from a mod that was added for other reasons, but it's in there, so oh well. But why stop there? More wood, more quest completions, more coins, and more loot bags. Side note, 
My opinion is that quest rewards are fair game for the starting with nothing rule set. I can access the quests with a keybind, so you are supposed to have access to them at all times, even if you don't have the quest book, and they clearly are not part of a naturally generated world. They also mostly just give you stuff that can kind of help kick you in the seat of the pants a little bit, rather than anything new and useful, exceptions to that rule coming up, so I consider it basically fine. Strategically, I am almost always going to pick the loot bag reward, unless there is something that I don't think I can get normally being offered, because loot bags can sometimes be useful. You can view the possible loot bag drop sets by going into creative mode and shift right clicking on the bag. Each bag has a chance of dropping a set of items from either the default item pool or the item pool that the bag is a member of, which in this case would just be basic Stone Age. Both are shown on screen. Upgrading the bag to its enchanted state removes the default item pool as an option, which isolates possible drops to only the named item pool. For the most part, this is what you're supposed to do, and is what I would do if it weren't for one amazing fact. There is exactly nothing that I want from the basic Stone Age item pool. Not a thing. A full 80% of it is either dye or random food, and I have both nothing to die and have no reason to worry about food, because I've been getting on just fine without it for a while now. All three plantable items on offer I either have already or can get from crop breeding, looking at you, sugarcane. I have zero use for clay, aside from taunting the apothecary villager, and the rest is stuff I can make, armor I don't need, or potions with effects I don't care about. I actually want to pull items from the default drop pool. The default pool, on the other hand, is full of building blocks, saplings, and items that I won't be able to get for a while, if ever. It's good stuff. Also, stuff that isn't really necessary for me right now. I will be holding on to these on the off chance that I can upgrade them to something better in the future. Anyway, enough about loot bags. My quest has given me enough coins to purchase oak saplings as a reward from the coins tab. I do that. I then turn it into an apple sapling, take a walnut sapling as a reward from that quest, and carry on with my life. I will need the coins and the quest it unlocks later, for other reasons that I will get into. I also do some more quest management and complete some of the easy quests with random items I have lying around. While I'm reading through the quest book, one of its informational quests reminds me that there is a couple of caveats that I should mention about this challenge. The short version of them is that first, while I did come up with this skyblock style starting from nothing challenge idea independently, I did not come up with it first. The second is that so far as I can tell, everyone who has tried this challenge, myself included, agrees that it is impossible to beat the game with this kind of rule set because reasons. I will leave the more nuanced discussion of this towards the end of the video, so you can easily skip over it if you aren't interested, but yeah. Like most other challenge runs, the mod pack is not designed for these sorts of restrictions. Sorry. After a little bit of messing around, my weed is very quickly spread and produces some delicious tasty grass. Soon the whole island will be a fetching shade of green and be infested with passive mobs, which will be the bane of my existence for many a future run. All according to plan. To get seeds, however, I will require a mattock, which requires tinker stuff to make, because I don't want to use up all of my iron hose if I can avoid it. After flailing around on a crafting bench, I slap together some basic tinkers and make myself a bone mattock. I now have, in addition to access to seeds, repairable tools that even deal a fairly decent amount of damage. This thing hits as strong as an unenchanted iron sword, which is pretty dang good at this point for being infinitely repairable. This means I can start saving infernal drops for processing into raw materials down the line. Now that I have wood, I'm kind of now in a bit of a holding pattern. I have a couple different technologies at my disposal that I can pursue and each has their own upside and downside. I could either explore down the industrial craft crop breeding line and secure myself some early wins by setting up a basic crossbreeding kit. This would be fairly expensive initially, especially since I am very short on any sort of material to craft tools out of, but it would give me a much more stable supply of building blocks in the form of wood from 
small pet saplings called bonsais. Alternatively, I could instead devote my resources to making a basic villager breeder and explore their trade options for further expansion. Both of these need to happen at some point, but I decide to start on the farms initially. It will be far easier to get villager breeding once I have an excess of disposable building blocks, and villagers don't really help with farming at all. All 23 of my fresh new crop sticks are planted with the oak saplings I accumulated through farming my coin purchase out. It isn't a lot, but it is enough for steady wood supplies for now, because once these things grow up, you'll get around two stacks of wood from harvesting them. I also add a second layer to my initial farm, because there is basically no such thing as too much farming at the moment. I am very quickly approaching the point where lots of dirt, gravel, and stone are going to be needed as well. To collect this, I want to take advantage of the power of charged creepers and disposable building blocks, so I create a little creeper charger. By pathing the creepers up and running them over the trap door, the creepers should fall in the water for storage and detonation damping so they don't, you know, blow up the entire farm. Once charged, I can then free them and route them to applicable locations wherever that may be. Hopefully. We'll see. I have passive mobs. Let's kill them. I isolate a lightning creeper. Unfortunately, it's glitchy and keeps trying to clip through the floor. It also defines a different route to me, ignores the trap entirely, and then explodes after a protracted game of Ring Around the Rosie. At least it was raining, so, you know, things don't catch on fire as much as they could have. Ooh, free Thompcraft loot bag. A gravel creeper is my next target, and it goes in without a hitch. Nice. Now for the lightning creeper. It is a little less cooperative and seems to think it can jump, but eventually falls in the hole as well. After my paranoia check passes, I detonate it carefully and succeed in charging up my gravel creeper. I then apply the patented shake and shimmy that brings all of the boys to the yard, and get a little close for comfort until it blows its top, covering my island in a fine patina of ground stone. Success? Sort of. Cleaning up the mess nets me a stack and a half of gravel at the cost of basically nothing, but it still feels weird that a crucial part of the game progression is now tied up exclusively in the process of covering my entire island in garbage. Anyway. I apply the same basic principle to a dirt creeper. I then do it again with a lightning creeper. You put the lime in the coconut, you shake it up, and then blow it apart to further your technological progress. Firefighting not included. And just like that, dirt. Plenty of it. So much dirt. More than I will need for a while, in fact, because my next project will be the villager breeder, which is purely dependent on wood. It will also require far more time than I have left in this video, so I will save it for the next episode. As always, thank you for your time. If you are inclined to that sort of thing, please do avail yourselves of all of the lovely tools that YouTube gives you to show your support in the usual fashion down below. It really does help a shocking amount, especially for newer channels like this one. If you're interested in hearing a bit more about my research into the work others have done on these Skyblock challenge runs, stick around, otherwise I will simply say I hope you enjoyed. You still here? Alright, you're still here. Research time! Let's dive into it a little. So, to reiterate, I am not the first person who has tried to do this challenge, and technically speaking, this challenge is impossible. There have been multiple documented attempts made by various groups and individuals to complete Skyblock kind of challenges like this one, with various different rules and config changes to make them work. There is no established precedent for what rules are valid or invalid here, because basically no one is crazy enough to try it. If you're interested in reading the history behind all of that, I will include some links below. All three of the previous runs that I'm going to link had a bit of a different spin on the idea of nothing. Rather than deciding to convert all worlds into void worlds, they either started out in a voided dimension, or just voided out the overworld and then restricted themselves to that empty dimension. Some of them played on peaceful difficulty for extra difficulty, and a couple of them spawned in a few items for various reasons, but those were very much not universal decisions. The routing of one of the challenge runs seems to indicate that you don't actually need 
to spawn anything in with my current rule set, but that's because my rule set is slightly more permissive than any of the other groups because I have access to all dimensions, there is just initially nothing in them. Either way, my rules seem like a pretty fair interpretation of the basic idea to me, and I'm not softballing myself here. Routing for all of these attempts, and I am very much including this run and earlier runs that I attempted in this category, is rough across the board. This is nothing like a mainstream speedrun or challenge run where everything is already theoried out ahead of time. There is a ton of room for new innovation, and it is cool that I'm going to be able to contribute to that. The second caveat that I want to talk about is the one that's a little bit sad. So with all of the rules that the previous runs were operating under, it was impossible to fully beat the mod pack. Period. The end game, which is creating something called a Stargate, is simply unachievable. There were too many things that you needed from too many obscure locations, and past a certain point there was no alternative way to get them. Currently, there are three confirmed items that blocked progression. The first is Bernarda Seawood for creating Radox. There is a sliver of a chance that I might have a tentative solution to this one, but I don't hold out hope so don't rely on it. The second item is a Chaos Shard from Draconic Evolution. I have made a configuration change to my world to re-enable an item that should normally be functioning, but was removed presumably to prevent grief on multiplayer servers, and that, combined with my Dimension Access Allowed rule, means that this item should be obtainable the quote-unquote normal way, the third is a source of tellurium, which normally comes from Temigam ores. I have no solution to this, and I don't think there is one with the version that I'm playing on right now. That version is admittedly a couple versions behind the most recent stable release. I'm on 2.3, and I think we're on 2.5 or 2.6 at this point. So I don't anticipate that it will make much of a difference. But if I truly find myself softlocked later on by something that is available in a future update, I will update. That said, the fact that this run is going to softlock itself is really not a surprise. I knew going in that it would most likely be impossible to fully 100% beat the mod pack, and was entirely fine with that. The goal here is instead to push the limits of what I know about this mod pack in a way that is hopefully entertaining enough for people to enjoy, and as long as I'm learning new things and breaking the game in new and ridiculous ways, I'm happy with that. And with that, I will end this video for real. Thank you for your time, twice over now, and I hope you enjoyed.